full benefits to doing this particular thing. So um, uh, one was it happened much more quickly. The Open Access Journal had some reviewers on hand and was willing to turn it around. And if we had published this in you know one of the very good communications journals or one of these other ones, it would be years before this was published, right? This is but this is a survey done a few. You know, maybe a month or so ago, and we wrote it up very quickly. This is there's a pending law in Congress called CAPA, and that this is bears on. And if we waited for some years to have this thing come out after peer review, it wouldn't have the impact that it would otherwise. The other one is in day one, there were 7,000 downloads of this article. Okay, so how I mean, an actual download that you can count from discrete places. There, you know, no article that you publish in even a prestigious journal is going to get 7,000 downloads. You know, reads. That's presumably people actually looking at it and caring about it, right? And if you look at, I, th I expect that citations will follow suit, right? Is that more people are gonna be more likely to see and cite that article. So even at the granular level, this should be better for faculty. This should be better for us and we should want to do it. But it is totally crucial to this whole story we're talking about of visioning. Um, in addition to that though, I think we have to think about the learning process and the way in which we access and discover the scholarship. So it's plainly step one to get the scholarship up there. And I love also um, your statement number four about co-production, how libraries can be in the business of digital scholarship with, uh, with, uh, with scholars. Um, but imagine a world in which what we have, instead of the sort of current publishing arrangement, is we have a whole lot of these different repositories. So URI has its, and Harvard has its, and Dukes has its, and so forth. Um, we have to think about how those get connected, um, and also more so than just having them on the internet, because that doesn't do enough. Um, one of the ways that that happens as a default, of course, is Google Scholar. So as we talk to graduate students, the way the default for them getting access to scholarship is not going to our um, library website and it's not going to our catalog. They start with Google Scholar in very large numbers, at least uh, in our world. Um, so Google Scholar connects all of these things. Um, I think there are benefits to that, but I also think that we in the library business should be in um, competition with Google in some ways. I'm not positive that we want to cede the poll position, we want to cede the position of being the gateway to all of this knowledge to a for-profit company. Um, I can get into my views on the Google Book settlement, which I think are, is an important piece of this, but it would go down another rat hole. Um, but I think worrying about the role that one company has in being the gateway to all this knowledge is important. And to think about our role um, as universities in putting together this knowledge environment, um, and I actually think libraries have a big uh, role to play. Um, so this may seem to be uh, a provocation that um, may not resonate, but let me try it anyway. Uh, one of the strategic approaches, in addition to open access, um, and jumping off this idea of being in sort of competition with Google, is thinking seriously about the role that computer science and user interfaces and so forth have um, within libraries. I think we should be in the business of creating, um, as computer scientists do with computer scientists, in the libraries, better interfaces for getting at this content. So there are a bunch of reasons why this is so. One is, one thing the faculty tell us consistently at Harvard is, yeah, you buy all those electronic journals, but we can't find them. We have a very hard time locating them. And those kind of lists that we have of uh, journals, they don't work especially well. Um, so we're actually wasting money on a lot of those things. That's kind of one of the problems. Um, another one, though, is the very serious um, sort of response that people often have to the idea of a virtual library. So I suspect you've all experienced the lament that people have, which say, if you get rid of all these stacks, what will we lose? One of the things people always say is serendipity. You will lose the idea of serendipity, that you walk into a library stack, and you had the call number, Dewey or LC or whatever, for that thing, and you're there, and you're kind of having a nice time and looking at these things, and oh my gosh, that's the one I needed. What an awesome one. And then by the end of it, of course, you're like stacked with seven books. You're like trying to make it out without dropping books. And it's embarrassing if you are the librarian too, because you're dropping and mistreating the books. But in any event, the idea that we present knowledge in this way that actually leads to discovery and learning that you didn't expect, right? Okay, so is it plausible in a digital world to have that same idea? Um, so one of the projects we're working on in uh, my uh, library is um, the idea of virtual browsing. Other people are working on this too. Um, but it has, I think, a bunch of different features. One feature is that I think we can do uh, even better in some respects than the, um, the stacks in terms of figuring out how to arrange objects in a way that people will discover things that they didn't expect. 
So we can't replace the must and the smell and so forth of the stacks, of course, although you could try aromatherapy or something with that. Um, but I think what you could do is you can tap into the knowledge we have about libraries and the knowledge we have in libraries to present information in lots of different ways that users can choose. Um, so this image is one from our stack view idea, which is based on circulation. This is, again, meant by way of provocation, not as the answer. Um, we took the data from 2009 across Harvard University um, and we've created a thing called Library Cloud, which is a metadata server where lots of libraries can put, we can share this aggregated circulation data. Um, so the idea is to say, if someone were searching, in this case, um, for Gravity's Rainbow, um, what would they see? So they would see Gravity's Rainbow and you can um, show how big the book is, right, based on um, this image. Um, but you can also give some hints about um, uh, other books that are related to it. So one hint we've decided in this case was to show um, how many times did books like it, including the book you had, circulate, and by whom. So if you wanted, as a graduate student, to say, how many times has a graduate student checked out the books that I can see here in the last year? Or how many times have faculty members checked them out? Or how many people have faculty members in my discipline checked them out and so forth? You can have some hints as to other things you might like. So in this case, Mason and Dixon turns out to be the hot one, um, 108 on the circulation um, heat map, and of course you can click and figure out what the algorithm is and how we weighted it. When things are on course reserve or when they've been recalled a lot, we use those data to give it higher scores. Um, presumably then that could also lead to um, you know, better acquisitions uh, information on the other side. Um, there are lots of other ways to, um, to cut this, and you could give um, lots of different kinds of views of the stack. Um, but my sense is it doesn't have to be worse in the serendipity front in the digital era. In fact, it might be better in some respects. Um, we might have to relearn how to do it and so forth. It may require new skills. Um, the other advantage that this approach has over the physical approach, maybe in combination with the physical approach, is that um, in our case, we have 73 different libraries. There is no stack. We also have about half of our stuff at a depository 26 miles away, which is growing every day with modules. There's no stack. There's no place you can go and see all those books, and it's also infinite, it's pretty big, right? So this is a way, you could imagine a series of regional libraries coming together and saying, across Rhode Island, could you find this, right? Um, you could use this across big campuses, or maybe you're collaborating with another university, maybe Brown and URI do it together to show what's there, right? You could do lots of things with these visualizations um, that I think will lead to search and discovery. Um, okay, so uh, last of the, um, kind of strategic areas that we're looking at um, is the idea of future mapping, which is plainly what you're doing here too. Um, does anybody know what this image is of? Have they seen it? Yeah, print on demand. So this is called an espresso book machine. This is not futuristic. There is one in um, uh, a bookshop in our town. Um, this is a company based in New York called On Demand Books. And uh, it's a pretty neat thing, actually. It's about the size of a big Xerox machine. And the one in the bookstore in Harvard Square, if you go into it um, and you say to the um, uh, uh, computer there, I would like to call up a particular book, you type it in into a Google interface, and you pay $8 with your credit card, and three or four minutes later, you get a printed book. Just prints it right out. There are millions of titles available, all, lots of public domain stuff. And I did it the other day for an F. Scott Fitzgerald book. I wanted The Beautiful and Damned to read. And that you know, have 10 different versions of it that you can pick from with lots of different forewords and whatever. And a few minutes later, you have this printed book. Okay, so why does this matter to libraries? Well, it could matter a whole lot to libraries in a whole lot of ways. Um, it's a huge competitive threat, potentially. Um, it could be a great friend. One might think about the ability to do just-in-time acquisitions, either to supplement or uh, to replace other forms of acquisitions. Um, it is obviously a little retrograde when we're talking about the digital, right? If you can get it immediately to somebody on their Kindle, um, uh, that's one way to think of this as maybe going to be overtaken by events very quickly. On the other hand, the way I think about it is that the materials, going back to my initial point, are born digital, right? So anybody who's writing a book right now is writing it on one of these, right? They're writing a Word document and giving it to their publisher. The publisher is then going to do a bunch of different things, right? One is print out a certain number of them and stick them in warehouses and hope that you're going to buy them as libraries or others. A middle thing they're going to do is to have it available print on demand, right? They're going to have the ability for somebody somewhere to be able to print it out quickly. It's much cheaper. They don't have to warehouse and so forth, right? On the other end of it, they will make it available for digital download on a Kindle or iPad immediately. If you think about this distribution model where the thing is born digital and the fact that we print it out is sort of an artifact, it's because we want it in that format for some particular purpose, that may make us rethink a lot of these library operations. Now, 
I don't like the idea that it get, gets rid of the selectors, the bibliographers, that it gets rid of the acquisition staff, that it gets rid of the catalogers because it's all in you know, cataloging records, that it gets rid of all the people who kind of put the barcodes on stuff and shelve them and bind them and so forth. Um, but that's a possibility. That's a possibility, I think, of where we're going in this way. And I think the point is, in a way, we have to think about the affirmative argument for libraries. What is it that gets back to why we have these libraries in the first place if the point is not to be a storage warehouse for books, right? I think if we are hurtling toward a world in which what we think our job is is to have a bunch of books in here and help somebody have it when they want it, we're obsolete really, really soon. Uh, we need a different model for what libraries are. And yet I believe the need for libraries is greater than it's ever been. I think the complexity of finding information in this much more um, varied and much more rich and much more confusing information environment is crucial. Um, so I really think we have to go back to the model. What is the model for libraries that we want? How does it fit with the mission of the community? Um, this to me this is the image of the Boston Public Library at the front. Um, this says it all to me, the idea of free to all, right? That's the public library mission. That's not exactly the academic one, but that's a powerful statement. It basically says no matter who you are, you can come through these doors and get knowledge. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, whatever, right? We need a version of that story that fits for this digital age. We don't necessarily have it yet, um, and I think we have to do it with a mission-specific way. How does it support the teaching and learning for this university or for this town or um, for the special situation in, a, in the form of a state? Um, I think the answer here is not that we are headed toward a utopia. I don't think the point is that because of digital technologies, we will have the most wonderful, you know, everything in every way. On the other hand, I think the possibilities are huge for teaching and learning, very positive possibilities um, in terms of creativity, in terms of innovation, in terms of activism, um, but also just simply in terms of learning. Um, but I think in order to get there, we have to imagine what we want it to look like. We have to be in the business of designing it affirmatively. That's why I think your process of visioning for 2020 is exactly the right one. We have to put something up there. Even though it's not gonna be utopia, we need something that we are building toward affirmatively. And I think we have to do that in collaboration. I don't think that can be one institution saying this is the vision of a library. It needs to be, this is an information ecosystem. This is the learning environment, the series of learning communities um, that we represent. And if we act more in concert, I think we'll be able to build one that is vastly better than the analog version and which can avoid many of the downsides that I think will be coming down the pike for libraries and for universities and others if we don't get in front of this mob and call it a parade. So with that, I think I will uh, end if that's okay. <laughs>